in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Tenebrae, darkness. Nighttime disorientates. Edges lose their sharpness. Shadows fill the corners. Time and space warp under the pressures of mood and sleepiness. The clock continues to tick. Even in the ancient world, when chronological time was only sketched through three or four watches of the night, especially in the night when the threats were not always visible. Jewish and Roman watchmen were the guardians of time, marking out its segments from sundown to dawn. Time is experienced very differently in the darkness. Its rhythms are different. No longer dictated by routines of work, the meetings to attend, the appointments to be kept. Daylight busyness bolts a structure in place, but darkness weakens that structure. Reality flickers, its surfaces disturbed. Between the onset and dwindling of darkness, the past, present and even future lose contours that they have in daylight. Ghosts in the ancient world always made their presences known in twilight hours. The spirits of the dead retain some degree of materiality, and so some light was needed for them to be seen. Ghosts often prophesied what lay ahead. The borders between the eternal and temporal, the far and near, the dead and the living shift through the night. Fears stir. On Sunday, we saw that what changes occur when Jacob wrestles with God in the darkness. On Monday, we saw how God called Samuel's name in the shadows of the Holy of Holies. God's presence fills the present as it gathers up the past and opens new futures. Jacob will become Israel. Samuel will be the prophet initiating and anointing the genealogy of Israel's kings. And here we are in the New Testament, again at night, with the disciples battling a storm on the Sea of Galilee. The isolation and aloneness that we noted with Jacob and Samuel, this time belongs to Jesus. He came to them out of his solitary prayer in the mountains skirting Galilee. And for a time, he watched the disciples struggling against the wind rowing into whipped waves. There's such a strangeness in this dramatic passage, and the focus is spliced by the narrator. On the one hand, we have Jesus walking through the wind and across the water to the disciples, and on the other, the future founding blocks of the church battling to stay afloat in a fragile vessel on the unruly water. There's an abrupt turnabout in perspective. First we view the vote from Jesus's point of view, and then we switch suddenly to the disciples seeing Jesus. Space gets crisscrossed, and sea was always a symbol of chaos in the ancient world. We are not told how long they fought the elements. We are not told how long Jesus stood watching them. Time dilates and contracts until about the fourth hour, the hour before dawn when he came. This was the time of hauntings and in Mark's gospel as in Matthew's, we are told the disciples thought they were seeing a ghost, 
phantasma. Jesus came to them like a phantom, stepping across the chaos. The ancient world was terrified of the sea. Drowning was the worst of deaths because the body was lost and there was no burial, no closure. Only gods could walk on water. But again, the narrator punctures the narrative. As the disciples watch him approach, Jesus would have passed them by. Knowing, seeing the danger the disciples were in, the future church was in, Jesus would have passed them by. And the disciples scream out in their panicked terror, their terror of him, their terror of drowning, their terror of the darkness. And immediately, he talked to them. The long silence of this episode, where the wind and tide tears away the words, the silence of Jesus' solitude and his seeming indifference is broken now. It is I. Do not be afraid. And the wind ceased, and he came into their boat. There is nothing the disciples have to express or understand what has just happened. Matthew has Peter come to Jesus on the water, and the disciples worshipping as Jesus enters the boat. But Mark stays with their emotions, emphasizing how disturbed they were. They were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure and wondered. For Matthew, this episode is a lesson in faith, attesting how the church must grow in its faith, how Peter as the founding apostle had to learn how to be faithful. In Mark, we have something different something raw and difficult to comprehend, something not explained. The encounter with the God who walks on water is plotted meticulously, but the event that remains, the event itself remains turbulent with meaning. The chaos of the storm does not go away. It's actually internalized by the disciples who were sore, amazed beyond measure. Their fear of drowning, their fear of the ghost, their fear of the darkness plunges them into speechless astonishment. The meeting in the night, on the water, the meeting is not a test. It is not about their faith. It is about a realization that will take a lifetime to comprehend. That this man, who they have eaten with, slept besides, helped in his labors as they fought off the crowds, this man is God. That knowledge rips apart everything with which they are familiar. It blinds time, space, circumstance, history, location, who they were as experienced fishermen, ordinary Jewish people, saints or sinners. All of it collapses as they undergo a baptism into the chaos before creation, the chaos and formlessness that still pertains and they are part of. And the darkness... Tenebre calls it forth. They are saved, literally, from drowning, spiritually, by Christ's presence in the boat with them. Saved not by doing this or that, not by any obedience to the law, not by any confession of sin, not by any act of faith. Jesus would have passed them by. 
but they cried out in the middle of the night when the world was overwhelming them. And God was there. Nothing was demanded of them. He came. The wind ceased. The darkness remained, for the night wasn't yet over. The disciples would never be the same, not after what they had experienced, after who they had encountered. This is where God finds us, in our darkness, in all the twistings and turnings of our faithfulness and unfaithfulness, our desire and often our need to be strong when we are not strong, we are, when we are on the edge of being engulfed. Jared Manley Hopkins knew this. I wake and feel the fell of dark, not day. What hours, oh, what black hours we have spent this night. What sights you, heart, saw, ways you went. And more must in yet longer light's delay. With witness I speak this, but where I say hours, I mean years, mean life. And my lament is cries countless, cries like dead letters sent to dearest him that lives, alas, away. So much turns in that sonnet upon that we, we have spent. It hangs among all those eyes and that single you like a lamp. Oh, what black hours we have spent. We is a flicker of hope because it speaks of a relationship, a binding in the despairing. Time collapses in those black hours. Where I say hours, I mean years, mean life. Darkness has consumed all sense of location. And even in his cry, it would seem Jesus would have passed by. These are the first eight lines of the sonnet. Another six lines follow. But the six lines that follow are not some assumption into the bliss and dazzlement of divine salvation. And neither were the disciples in their salvation launched by their encounter with God towards mystical heights. The darkness remained. But there is a we, a we. And the love in that we is stronger than death. Even so, there is no avoiding the twisted olive trees of Gethsemane. Amen.